are visiting with us today, we bid you a particularly warm welcome. Uh, and to show what a warm, friendly church we are, um, I be some of the visitors are here. Some of you slip through without checking in on the welcome desk first. But to show you what a nice, warm, friendly, informal congregation, I'm not going to use surnames because I wasn't given any surnames. <laughs> but if, if you are named and you're comfortable doing so, we would love for you to stand so that once I've gone through all the names, we can express our welcome to all our guests. Uh, Lynn and Dave from Ohio. Brian from Indiana. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Reed and his family from very close by. <laughs> Kathy... Uh, Beck and Kurt from Indianapolis. Welcome. Uh, Bobby and Fred. Chris Ann and Joy from Bradenton. Delighted to have you all with us, including those who slipped by without leaving a name at the welcome desk. Let's tell our guests. <laughs> that we are pleased to have you with us and we hope after service you will find your way through to Fellowship Hall, enjoy one another and the good things that are provided for us there. Uh, by way of um, announcements this afternoon, the second of this season's uh, concerts uh, features uh, Sam Nelson on the organ and it promises to be a very stimulating uh, organ recital this afternoon. Tomorrow morning, uh, no men's club, because the men's, uh, sorry, no men's Bible study, because the men's club breakfast uh, takes place. 8.15 start for 8.30, and uh, George Rao is going to be the featured speaker at tomorrow's men's club. And then at 7 p.m., the choir will hold its rehearsal in Fellowship Hall as usual. Pastor's focus group, working through Tish Harrison Warren's book, Liturgy of the Ordinary, is shifting from Thursday afternoon to Tuesday afternoon. And so we'll be meeting this Tuesday at 4 p.m. And I apologize to those of you who are regulars with the Bridge Club and the Canasta Group that there's a bit of a calendar clash in there because both these groups are meeting this week. The announcements in the bulletin tell you about it. Wednesday, Women's Bible Study as usual. And then looking slightly further ahead, on February 10, our walking group resumes. On Wednesday, February 16, uh, we have our Wednesday night dinner, and uh, this month, uh, West Coast Black Theatre are coming for what will be a stunning uh, musical experience. Uh, to help us with all our planning, uh, we encourage you please to sign up, either today or at the very latest next Sunday. Signing up, registering A, if you hope to be present, but then, equally importantly, B, if you're willing to stay behind afterwards and help tidy up after the dinner is over. Uh, there are sign-up sheets in Fellowship Hall, and we very much encourage you to use them. Uh, if you're a member of the book club, you probably know the change of date for the next meeting. Uh, the book club is now going to meet on Wednesday, the 23rd of February, and details again are in the bulletin. Then Monday, February 28, the second of the Christian Reading Matters group, uh, looking at Philip Yancey's Where the Light Fell. Uh, at our worship next Sunday, uh, we hope to uh, introduce new members uh, to the congregation. Uh, because of the pandemic and the changes to our worship schedule, we've had new members who joined us way back in 2020. We haven't had opportunity yet to acknowledge in worship so some of them will be here next week. Anyone else who's interested in connecting with Christ Church, please stop by the welcome desk, uh, get more information, uh, and uh, learn what uh, membership in this lively congregation uh, represents. And then uh, just a couple more very quickly. Uh, because Sanctuary is beginning to get a bit busy, uh, that means that outside in the parking lot is beginning to get a bit busy. And uh, if you're a regular and you're able to do so, uh, we encourage you, please, uh, to consider using the um, parking at the office building next door at 6350 
or if you don't mind a walk in the morning, the county building uh, further up General Harris Street, uh, we are allowed to use their parking uh, on a Sunday. And that way we're leaving space closer to the church, either for those uh, who need to park close because of mobility issues or because of those people who turn up at two minutes to 10 and hope to find a parking space. We're delighted to have you with us. In our worship today, we celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we are trying a new all-in-one uh, communion element. We hope it will be a little more user-friendly. Uh, the, uh, there's a label at the top, which is a fairly easy uh, pull-off label to uh, access uh, the wafer, which serves as communion bread, and then uh, you um, tip it over and access the, uh, the grape juice for the communion wine. Uh, we recommend doing it in that order <laughs> for reasons that you've figured out. Okay. It is great to have you with us. It is great to share in the privilege of offering God our worship and our praise. Friends, together, let us worship God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us be glad in the presence of our God, for the Lord is near to those who call upon him.
Please be seated. In the confidence that God delights to hear and answer prayer, we make confession as together we pray. We call you Lord of life, and yet we often do not see how you can be involved in every day. We let change unsettle us and do not ask how you might want us to change in our response. We let interruptions annoy us, but fail to think that interruptions might be hidden opportunities for some act of service or witness. We let people disappoint us, but never ask about the times when we have disappointed others or those times when we have disappointed you. Forgive us, Lord. Fill our days with pointers to your presence in our world. Surround our heart with echoes of your love. And let us see and hear and faithfully live out our trust in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, the mercy of our Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. We rejoice in God's gift of new life and full forgiveness. Thanks be to God. In response to God's gifts, we dedicate our gifts to God. Let us pray. Lord, you bless us with all we are and with all we have. Bless us also as we seek to give ourselves to you through the offering of our time, our resources, our willingness to serve, and the contributions we make to support the life and work of your church on earth, here in this place, and through all the agencies we seek to support. Thank you for this privilege. Bless and use our gifts, we pray, to your glory and your praise. Amen. Our first scripture this morning, Isaiah 6. 1 through 11. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> the whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. 
make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is utterly desolate. Amen. Our second reading this morning is from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank <laughs> you. 
like many of you I know, I enjoy reading. But I suspect that also like many of you, you find it more than a little frustrating. There are so many books lining up to be read and attended to, and I know I'm never going to get to them. And it doesn't really help if you tell me to buy the book, because that might then make me read it. I used to have in my study a shelf reserved for new books to be read. And then it grew and became two shelves, and then three shelves, and then I gave up. And what provoked this confession was a review in Christianity Today this week of a new book titled Public Confessions, The Religious Conversions That Changed American Politics. And the book describes the spiritual journeys of figures from the mid-20th century and beyond, people like Charles Colson, Muhammad Ali, Marilyn Monroe, Sammy Davis Jr., and others. It then describes the way their new faith rippled across the public square and set people talking, and in some cases, doubting. The book review says, these conversions, honest or not, sparked national conversations. Conversions are always partly public. Claims of belief, and especially changed belief, are always partly provocative. This book offers readers ample opportunity to ask themselves whom they believe and why, as well as what might make their own profession of faith believable to a watching world. And then the reviewer finishes, if I believe God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, and because of that I should love my enemies, practice resurrection, and hang on to my faith that the truth will set us free, I should just accept that everyone is looking at me. That got me thinking. A conversion involves some kind of encounter with the divine and should produce some kind of outcome in the convert's life. Have you ever considered the thought that as a Christian, other people are looking at you, asking, so you're a Christian, what's next? This morning we read two stories that amounted to conversion stories. They were experiences that changed the people involved. What are we to make of them? I love Isaiah 6, over and above its inspiration for our opening hymn. The chapter tells of an experience that blew Isaiah away. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, he says. Whatever he saw, he couldn't really describe. All he can talk about is the hem of a garment filling the temple, smoke air, winged creatures flying around the temple, and the whole place shaking as if caught up in an and an overwhelming sense of God's holiness reduced him to a confession of inadequacy and a horrified sense of the sinfulness he shared with the entire nation. Amazingly, he's not thereby 
disqualified. Instead, he receives a symbolic cleansing of unclean lips that John Calvin says is, is sacramental. It's just like a sacrament, a visible sign of God's invisible grace. And in gratitude for that grace, when God asks, whom shall I send? His response to God's grace is, here am I, send me. And God says, okay. So, yes, it's a story about Isaiah's vocation, his calling to be a prophet, but wrapped up in that is a story of conversion, his forgiveness, his response to God's grace. So, it is also a confession story. And the first thing the story alerts us to is the miraculous mystery of God's grace. We don't know the details of his life that provoked the anguished confession from Isaiah about being a sinful man among a sinful nation. But it's a pattern we see often enough in Scripture to be prompted to recognize it. Moses, Samuel, David, Saul who became Paul, Simon Peter, all of them signs of God's preferential option for the unlikely, which reminds us, or it should, when considering our call as Christians, that if God entrusts His message to unworthy carriers, then there's room in that company for you and for me. Maybe not as a prophet, but surely as a witness, as someone who can say that the mysterious, gracious God has touched me, certainly touched my heart so that I may love Him, but perhaps also touched my lips so that I might speak of Him or touched my hands and set me to doing things for Him, or my feet, that I might go somewhere He needs me to be. Now, notice from both the stories we've read, God's call does not guarantee applause, success, or even the gratifying feeling of a job well done. Peter's discovery led to a life during Jesus' ministry of, let's be kind, uneven performance. And sometimes it's our mistakes. Sometimes it's the headwinds we face in encountering a difficult situation that frustrates us and leaves us feeling, I wish I could have done more. But that doesn't mean, and the stories want us to understand this, that doesn't mean that God isn't there active and at work and willing to use us. Mark Laberton left parish ministry to become the president of Fuller Theological Seminary, and he published to mark his accession to that new position. He published a book on Christian vocation, on God's calling to the lives of Christians. And he admits to his own somewhat uneven performance. I've certainly been in circumstances when doing what I believed I was called to do was painful and difficult. One of the most challenging was a time when I felt I was in the wrong church. This was many years ago, and to this day, I'm not sure whether it was God's call that I go to that church and serve there. What I am confident of is that God used 
the challenges and difficulties of that season to form me into a different person. The Lord refined and remade me at a deep level during those days. Everything about my own call since that time has been enhanced in both quality and character. And so, let me suggest, looking at Isaiah, looking at Peter, if you run into times when the headwinds are strong or when you're tired and weary and feel you can't continue, remember the grace of God that works in us and through us, but sometimes beyond us and sometimes even despite us. As Isaiah discovered, what's next for Isaiah is a ministry among people who did not want to know. His message fell on rocky ground, and the fruits were sparse indeed. But the book that bears the name of Isaiah bears powerful testimony to God's grace. Historians tell us that his conversation, his, his conversion rather, his conversion occurred probably in the year 739 BC. Change of monarch, rising Assyria, threatened Israel, kind of the way Putin is threatening Ukraine. And the national response in Israel of that day was to turn to anywhere and anyone except God and God's will. And Isaiah's calling was to rebuke that lack of faith and warn of the disaster it would produce. And the first 39 chapters of the book address this headwind situation. And his words came true. But get this, not until 586 B.C., more than a century later. And in all that time, God had been persisting, God had been seeking, God had been challenging and challenging. And then in the book, as we have it today, in chapter 40, a whole new atmosphere Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her penalty is paid. Fifteen chapters follow of encouragement and good news. You're coming home again. God promises it. And they did. 535, decades later. And then the last few chapters of the book address the situation where starting all over again, rebuilding a nation proved an uphill struggle and a challenge to faith. And the final chapters speak to those difficult days. So, very different moods, very different messages. It's presented to us as the work of one prophet, Many scholars believe that actually what happened was that the Isaiah, of whom we read in chapter 6, then became the leader and the inspiration for a succession of followers who in different generations picked up his mantle, continued his work, and addressed the people in the name of God. Either way, the point of the book is the involvement of God the persistence of God, and the grace of God. Times keep changing. God does not. Over approximately 200 years, the rulers in the nation came and went. God didn't. The people in the public eye changed. God didn't. The situation shifted. The challenges were different. 
God did not change, because through it all and in it all, God remained constant. The testimony of faith is beautifully summed up in that lovely paraphrase of Psalm 34, through all the changing scenes of life, in trouble and in joy, the praises of my God shall still my heart and tongue employ. Because God is there, hidden but active, challenging and loving. And what I like about these Scripture stories is the challenge, almost the rebuke they offer to our instant society. We are so obsessed with the immediate that we overlook the important. We assume if God doesn't deliver on some promise or answer some prayer, preferably yesterday, but at the very latest today, then God is not to be trusted. And Scripture says, think of the God you are approaching, and think of the way His timing may be bigger than yours. Think of the big picture and the reliability and faithfulness of God experienced across the generations, and get on board with God's kingdom work and God's ongoing grace. During his presidency, John F. Kennedy once visited NASA, and in his visit he saw a janitor mopping a floor. Kennedy asked him what was the job that he did at NASA, and the gentleman said, I'm helping send a man to the moon, which is exactly the same point Bill Coffin of Riverside Church in New York used frequently to make in the story he once told about a traveler in the Middle Ages who came upon three men working on a building site. He asked them what they were doing. The first man said he was laying stones. The second man said he was building a wall. The third man, asked what he was doing, replied, I'm building a cathedral. They were all doing the same stuff, same kind of work, but one of them had the big picture. And so, let me encourage you, amid the challenges that we encounter today and the difficulties which the Christian church faces in our broken culture. Keep the faith. Remember that the work of God has encountered headwinds before and has not been defeated, and God's people, though often discouraged, have not been defeated. I love the story that is told about Winston Churchill during World War II. It was middle of, middle of the, the war, and the Allied effort was not going well. And Churchill's war cabinet met in the underground room that was their war room to look at options and assess prospects. The generals had a grim story to share. The experts had no solution to offer, and as one after another spoke, the atmosphere got more and more depressed and discouraging. The odds seemed insuperable, the enemy unstoppable. And then 
Churchill broke the silence. Gentlemen, he said, I find it rather inspiring. And if we were alive to the meaning of our faith, if we were connected to the reality of our God, if we remember that at the center of our faith, the seeming defeat upon a cross of Jesus of Nazareth shows the marvelous mystery of God's grace and the way in His people, through His people, and sometimes despite His people, God works to advance God's purpose. What's next is in God's hands, and we can leave the future there if we just keep our faith. Let us pray. Give us the faith, dear God, to see beyond the immediate, beyond the insistent, to grasp the important, and to look to the invincible. Bless us and keep us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing and join in the affirmation of our faith as given us in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We come to the Lord's table, and we do this together in remembrance of Jesus. It is finished, Jesus said upon the cross, and so it was. His life of faithful ministry and perfect obedience to His Father's will, faithful even unto death, obedient even to the cross, and then through the cross, life to all the world, to break the power of sin and make all things new. In this service, Jesus gives us bread to speak of His body broken but restored, and wine to warm us with God's renewing grace. And so in this service, we remember, we rejoice, we renew our faith in Jesus, 
Lord and Savior. Let us pray. God of eternity, Lord of the passing years, we thank you for the life you give us, for the blessings of past years, the gifts that are new every morning, and the future to which you call us in love. Thank you for your unchanging faithfulness and your renewing grace. We rejoice in your promise to be with us all our days. Thank you for Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Jesus came to unite us to you in an unbroken fellowship of love and joy. Not as we ought, but as we are able, do we praise you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for Jesus, baby of Bethlehem, teacher of Galilee, Savior of Calvary, and Lord of the empty tomb. We rejoice that he came to heal this broken world and mend our broken lives. Remembering your grace to us in Christ, we take this bread and wine and joyfully celebrate his death and resurrection. By your Holy Spirit, grant that the bread which we share and the cup which we bless may be communion to us in Christ's body and blood to feed our hearts and souls until he comes again. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with all his followers in every age and land. Our God, we offer ourselves to you a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. In your mercy, accept this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as, with all your people, we ask you to fulfill in us and in all creation your loving and redeeming purpose. And as our Savior taught us, we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And so we take the bread. And as we share the bread, we pray, Bread of the world, in mercy broken, by you the words of life were spoken. Speak to our hearts, receive our praise, and journey with us through these days. And we do this in remembrance of Jesus. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And as we receive the cup, we pray, Jesus, true and living vine, Lord of mercy, grace divine, sustained by you, we seek to live. Your grace, your mercy, Lord, now give. And we do this in remembrance of him. A 
Now let us pray. Almighty God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can ask or desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. As we prepare for our life in God's world, we encourage one another with this prayer. Living God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature with the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives show forth your glory, that we may be a people worthy to be known as Christians. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 